All right, everyone. So welcome back to the class. We're on uh, week four, day uh, eight, I guess, whatever it is. And uh, yeah, if you look at the calendar, this is the last week of the class. Now, obviously, I said from day one, and I sent out the emails even before the class started that you should be enrolled in part one and part two, CAS 125 and 126, if you want the certificate. If you're only here for you know, the first part of things, okay, fine. Um, this will be the first week. This will be the last week that we see you, au revoir. But you probably want to continue in the class, uh, which starts next week. And it'll be the same thing, Mondays and Wednesdays, 12 to 2.30 on Canvas. It's just that Canvas will now activate a new uh, Canvas uh, class um, marked as CIS 126, Animation 2, whatever the name of it is. You'll still be able to go back to this part one and look at all the material, turn in any late work. Um, that's perfectly fine. But we, you will start to see uh, Monday morning uh, a brand new entry of um, Animation 2. And so you're not going to see it yet. The class hasn't officially started. But it'll be a new course, but the same as before. Just be aware of that. So uh, there was also the, in back in the syllabus, remember the syllabus, I titled it a CIS 125 plus 126. And so all along there, and I showed it on the first week, and it's always been there, uh, the assignments. We're not done with all the assignments, of course. We're only halfway through the class. So that's always been the goal. And then in the total of the whole summer, all of the nine weeks, I'm counting it all as the complete nine weeks, we've, uh, we've got the complete class. So yeah, part one ends today and there's various things you've turned in. And if you're only taking part one, great, you'll be graded on the work you've done in part one. But obviously most of you are taking part one and two because you want the, de the degree and such. And so we're just gonna continue with everything. Looking a little bit forward, so 4th of July uh, lands on a Tuesday. So the school is doing the holiday on a Tuesday, which is weird. So we will have a regular Monday class meeting. I thought we were going to have it the holiday on Monday, but um, it's on Tuesday, July 4th is the holiday. And therefore on that day, we're not going to meet in class like we never do. So it's not going to bother us, uh, but that's a day to take off. Uh, Monday, that Monday, I sent out a message on the announcements. We've got a guest speaker. They're coming in via Zoom and they're going to talk to us at about one. And uh, they are a, a person that worked in, uh, that has worked in the world of animation and gaming for like 20 years or more. His name is Rich Reagan. He's worked in various uh, companies. And so he's gonna uh, come to us on Zoom and just talk about his experience uh, getting into the industry, advice for beginners and just all of this stuff. And there'll be time to ask him questions and the like as well. So that'll be Monday, it'll be recorded. For class, but obviously if you're here live in person or on Zoom, then you can ask at that moment and it will be uh, you know, more interactive if you want. So that's coming on the Monday and then further work. So as we're seeing this week, script and storyboard, but starting to look at some stuff of animation. The next week, scenes plus animation plus sound. We want to see about adding sound to our uh, projects, of course, at a certain point. And then next week after that, animation project work. So if you kind of see, there's going to be three weeks or so, two and a half weeks or so of the of the learning and the time to work on the animation of things. Animation is a big endeavor. And when it's you by yourself, it's a lot of work. So I am putting a lot of time in there for that. And then, of course, there'll be the time for then the game parts of things, three weeks or so on that. So... There's plenty of time to accomplish everything that we want, but not so much time that you can indulge in perfectionism. So again, be careful about that, about trying to make things perfect, because within a limited time, that might be something that holds you back. So that's what's coming up in the future. Guest speaker and all of this work. So. Um, let's get into, or let me pause here, questions, comments on any of that, of what's coming up and such. 
um, let me ask all of you, how many have looked at any of the videos that I put besides the recording of the lecture, of course, I added these resources on week four um, from BAM Animation. So how many of you have looked at any of these so far? A couple of you, very good. If you haven't, you should. It is part of the class material. Yeah, there, some of them are 20 minutes long. Some of them are six minutes long, but it is also stuff that will supplement the class besides what I show you in class. And as I've said before, and I'll keep saying that the more you effort you put into anything, not just an artistic effort, the more it pays off. So for example, the 12 principles, it's not that you need to know all 12 techniques that were invented 90 years ago that still apply today, but the more of these that you know, the more of the rules that you know, the better off you might be. And when you need to break the rules or bend the rules, you know what you're doing. Uh, today, we're going to do a hands-on making a walk cycle. One of the important aspects of animation, whether for film or games, is making a character move, making it walk realistically. It is one of the hardest things to animate. We can so easily walk. We've been doing it for a long time. But to animate walking can be a very hard thing. So we're going to have some lessons and activities on that today. And you've got that video there. And you can find a thousand more videos on YouTube on that same topic. And uh, supplemental to that is this 16-minute video, How to Start Animating Your Character. On that one, they took four, like the top four of 12 animation techniques, and they kind of tell you over and over, okay, these are these the main four. If you don't want to memorize all 12, these four right here are really going to get you on track. So all of these you should watch at some point. That's another, whatever that adds up to, two, four, six, eight, ten, about 90 minutes, uh, an hour and a half or so of material. But um, that's part of the class as well. So open up Adobe Animate. You probably already did. You want to sign in. You do some frame by frame animation. And we're going to look at a variety of types of animation. We're going to look at the animation of frame by frame where you draw every single movement, which can be very powerful, but very time consuming. We'll also look at the animation techniques of um, queens. Well, not animation for tweens, but tweens type of animation. We'll see what that is, in-betweens. And then also rigging with bones. So you draw a character, you put bones in it, and you'll be able to make it move via in a skeleton. So lots of ways that we will see for animation. So starting up animate, going to create a new project, just go with the usual full HD. We're going to change it to 24 frames per second. Now that's a nice shortcut there, but you have to then do that extra step of changing it to 24 frames. So instead of picking the shortcut, if you click on create new, that will pop up maybe a little time saver. Here's the full HD and I can set 24 here. So it is a shortcut right there, but it gives you the 30 frames per second. Instead, select Create New, Full HD, 1920, 24 frames. Standard speed of animation, 24 frames. Um, they used to also let you choose your background color here. I guess they removed that, but there was also a little spot here. Unless my window is small, I have to resize my window to fit on the projector. But um, there used to be a little icon also to select your background color. I would still, again, recommend to change your background color to anything besides white so that you see, so that you make sure that you're seeing everything that's on your screen, on your stage. Save that. On, if you were here on Monday, you might have made a folder. Save this to that folder. If you don't have your folder, just make a folder, save this, uh, get in the habit of your work should be saved in a folder, not just on the desktop. And that is technically important for later. Uh, a project should be set up in its own folder for its various assets and pieces and such. So just get used to doing it that way.
All right, so walk cycles. We are gonna practice a little bit making a two-legged character walk. And we're gonna see that it doesn't need to be a lot of frames to look smooth. We saw when we played with the bouncing ball animation on Monday that we were doing what is known as animating in twos, where we had a keyframe and then a frame and then a keyframe and then a frame. So it was like two. The drawing was shown for two 24ths of a second at a time. So instead of 24 unique drawings in one second, we only need 12. And 12 drawings is enough for there to be a good amount of smoothness in the animation. So I've got a guide here so that we just don't dive into it with an empty document. So now do this for a moment. Uh, minimize, animate, go to the desktop, and in the web design folder, I've got a file for you. So go to desktop here, go up to data files. Web design folder, go to our class folder and then copy. Don't just double click it and such. You want to copy it. This walk two legs side.gif. You can right click it and copy. Right click it and paste into your project folder. You want to do this so that you don't edit it for anyone else. You want your copy of it, paste it into your project folder. Let me also upload it to Canvas right now. I'm going to put it in the week four. Where should I put it? Um, yeah, I'll put it in the week four resources for those of you at home. This into the week four, this little walk cycle graphic. This is one of many you can find all over the internet as a starting point example, but I like it because it's got a bunch of examples. There's many ways to make a character walk slowly, quickly, et cetera. Happy, morose, et cetera. And when you get a copy of that picture, you can take a quick look at it. We'll open it in animate, of course, in a moment. But if you just open it basically like that, here's a comparison of the various two-legged forward movement cycles. And so here's a regular old walk, a double bounce walk, a strut shuffle, and the idea is to use this as a, as a tracing tool through my guidance, where we will make a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight or so animation or frames of animation to make some walking. Now, this is a cartoony type of character versus a realistic character versus a four-legged character versus a character that is a spirit with no legs. There's lots of ways to do this, of course. But to start off with this um, example, before we open it and animate, let's break it down into several different things. Look at the head and notice these, four these five lines behind the character. So notice on this first frame, the head, where it is, then it's slightly lower, then a little higher, then a little more higher, starts to lower, 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 higher. So there is a curve that is happening here. And in animation, it's going to be a little bit more obvious than in real life. If you see me walking right now, it might be extremely subtle. But in animation, you're going to see it much more. That's the sort of sine wave um, of movement is going to be more obvious in animation. See this curve, high point, low point, high point, low point, head. Well, in order for that to happen, let's look at the feet. There's a portion in the feet where the legs are taking a big step out there, and then it's eventually going to raise up like this. So at this point, to exaggerate, if my legs are out like this, this is the lowest point where my head is at. Okay, we can use this. These are the farthest out. And then when I'm about to take the step right here, notice how higher it got. So we're uh, leading towards the lowest point. And then this is the squash and strength. And so far, you get to that low point. 
and over. So basically six or eight or even less. And over can create a convincing animation, a walk cycle. We don't need the full 24 drawings in one second to make this look like it's moving. We, if we know how to draw it right, with the sizing and spacing and such, squash and stretch and all of that, we can do it in a, in a lot fewer frames. Not necessary, but notice also the arms are moving. And notice how they drew this in a way that the objects that are further from you are darker. So the, um, so, you know, there's the left hand at us, I guess, and then the right hand on, on the other side, and it's darkened also for you to see it. So the arms and the legs, first of all, it's a pair, how it's moving, and then the arms, how it's moving. The body itself doesn't change too much. The, the head is still a circle. The arms are some amount of change, but the legs are some of the big changes. That's where an animation of walking really falls apart. If you can't make the legs, the things touching the ground look right. The arms can be all whatever, but if those legs and feet are not hitting the ground in the right ways, that's going to look weird. Just to compare with um, a run, here we have again the high point, low point, high point, low point. Now here, the animation, the exaggeration in animation, squash and stretch, notice how this point right here, making a really big leap, really stretched out. When we did the, bo the ball and we made it a little bit more realistic, you know, it was, it was falling down and we stretched that out a little bit as it was falling down to kind of show the force of gravity. It hit the ground and it then deformed a little bit. It splatted a little bit and then it came back up again and it stretched out. The more you do it, the more exaggerated, the more cartoony, the less you do it, the more realistic. When you never do it, it's too mechanical. Maybe you want that. Maybe you want a robot that is mechanical and very precise, but with uh, other types of things moving, you want some kind of cartooniness of it. And the jump, this is very exaggerated. The tension here, about to hit the ground, hits the ground, squashes, building up the energy, anticipation, stretch, floating in the air for a bit, got a lot of hang time. There's some anticipation, follow through all those 12 principles to make some good animation. So maybe assistance. You can also find some cool uh, examples of walk cycles and the like, put them in the um, web design folder for us just to have more of those to work with. So we're going to use this as a starting point in animate our layer, layer one, let's call it trace, tracing, whatever. Double click it or right click it to um, set this as opacity 50, set it as a guide. It's before where we then will import a picture onto the screen. Best thing is to change its various properties, fade it out a little bit, opacity 50 or so, and then turn it into a guide. Bio import to stage, control R. Your copy in your project folder, your desktop, wherever you saved it. Select your picture, and we're going to resize this so that we can focus on. So the resize, the resize um, tool, free transform tool Q. I remember it as quick transform. I guess quick, quick edit. So the free transform, so that you can get larger. We'll focus on the first one of walk, as large as you want to fit, as much as you want on your canvas. Lock. Let's do that. Anyone need a little help? You found the file, you imported it into the app. Everyone's good. Anyone need, need any help?
Now we're going to do this several different ways for practice. We're not just going to go in and trace it. We're going to first do it in the technique of a stick figure. We're going to simplify it down to a stick figure. And then we're going to build on top of it a basic shape. And then on top of that, maybe a character. So we'll do it in di several different ways. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight frames. And like I said, I want to animate in twos. I want every frame, I want every drawing to be visible twice. Eight times two, 16. So we're gonna need at least 16 frames here. So on our tracing layer, find frame 16. Find frame 16 on your tracing layer. Press F5 to extend the tracing image to the 16th frame, right? The black dot means there's something there. The gray box means it doesn't change. Here, let's walk one. New layer, walk one. What did I say last time that once you've got a layer, you've added a bunch of frames, a bunch of time, and you add a new layer, it'll automatically fill in all of that amount of frames, which I don't need yet. So we need to remove these extra frames. Select all those extra frames, right click, remove frames or shift F5. That first starting frame. Never thought about it, but there might be an option in the options so that it doesn't automatically do that. But I've just gotten used to it that every time you make a new layer, it's just automatically going to fill in a bunch of frames that you might not need. So frame one, make sure you've locked the tracing layer. Now up here with the, with the brush tool, maybe line tool, anything you want. Uh, with some color, I'm going to go with just bright red. Maybe zoom in a little bit. Very simply, there is the main body right there. A leg that has a foot. Back leg that has a foot. Don't worry about here, like the, the toe is bent back a little bit, hitting the floor. You could draw that if you want, but I'm just going very, very simply, keeping a very simple leg and foot. Obviously there's a knee in there that we'll get to in a moment. There's an arm, upper arm, lower arm, maybe the hand. Upper arm, lower arm, hand, head. It's very useful to, once in a while, turn off your tracing layer to also kind of look at it to see how, how I've done so far. Again, I'm not worried about the perfection of it just yet. I'm just, I've just got a starting point. Okay, so I want this frame, this pose to exist for two frames. I'm animating in twos. I want a drawing to exist twice. So skip two frames, frame three, F, F6 to duplicate the previous drawing to change it. I don't want that this time. I'm making a new drawing. I want a new frame. F6, which is the same as right click, convert to keyframe. It copies your previous drawing so that you can change it. And sometimes you need that, but in this case, I don't. In this case, I want F7 convert to blank keyframe. 
So on frame three, either right click, convert to blank keyframe or memorize F7. See the difference here. F6 makes a, a new frame, copies the previous frame. It's like a copy and paste basically for the whole frame. And then I can make changes. I don't want that. I want F7. We created a brand new empty keyframe. See how the circle there is, is empty. So that then I can draw the next pose here. Body, instead of the straight leg, we've got upper leg, lower leg, foot, leg, lower leg, foot, upper arm, lower arm, hand, head, hiding my tracing layer, scrubbing back and forth. Back and forth in what I've drawn so far, just scrubbing that playhead, just moving it back and forth. Or on the keyboard, I kind of find this a little faster. On the keyboard, you have period and comma. You can move back and forth quickly on the keyboard, period and comma, rather than dragging it around with the mouse. If my hand's over here and I just want to go back and forth quickly, my hand's already on the keyboard probably, so I can then easily go back and forth on frames. Jumped two frames over, frame seven, or sorry, frame five. I need a new blank keyframe. I need a new sheet of paper. Think of these as sheets of paper. Each one of these frames is a sheet of paper that you're drawing on. And then when you flip the paper to do the animation, that's just happening digitally. New sheet of paper, new blank keyframe. I'm on the third pose here. That's right. F7 on all of these because we want to draw a brand new pose. F7 here, here's the leg over here. This other leg. You can also, as you see the example, leg is touching the ground, leg is starting to lift from the ground, lifting up a little higher, moving on the other side of my leg, not on the ground, down, about to touch the ground, touches the ground, there's the exaggeration of the squash and stretch technique of animation. Obviously, in my own regular walking here, there isn't that exaggeration, but in animation, you do. That gives you a little bit of more realism, depending on the style of animation, of course. Now, right here, you have to be a little creative. Okay, where do I put the rest of that arm there? Just kind of use your best judgment. If the if the hands are kind of moving like this, well, at a certain point. The backhand over here is going to be over here somewhere. You're going to have to draw it somehow. And one of the techniques, one of the pro tips of animation is get a mirror or a friend where you can observe them or yourself moving and such. Um, not just off the top of your head. Animation is very difficult to do off the top of your head. You do want to have some kind of a reference, a tracing reference, a mirror that you can look at yourself as you look and make funny faces or... Uh, a friend that is walking and then you notice how they're walking and draw them and such. And um, in this case, now you see here, okay, so the head's way up here. Yeah, creatively, however you want to do that so that it kind of makes a little sense. Skip two frames, F7 again. I'm on the next drawing over here. So I'll let you do that for a moment. You get the idea. Do all eight of these two frames at a time. Draw each one for a moment. And I'll show you what's next. But go ahead and do that for a bit. Anyone having any trouble, any questions? That, draw those eight.
All right, so when we get to the end right here, don't forget to also fill in the last two frames where you've got your eighth drawing and then you have an empty frame there. Make sure that you are consistent where you have a frame, you have a keyframe, then a frame, a keyframe and a frame. And then at the end, you ended up with a frame and that's F5. So at this point here, I'm gonna save that. I'm gonna hide my tracing layer. Let me zoom out. And if you do the test movie, if you play it, some amount of movement. So cool. <laughs> There's the life of it happening there, perhaps. Obviously, the more I practice, the more smoother it'll be. But at this point, based on this starting point, I have all these poses. Now, it looks kind of fast. It looks like it's moving really fast across the screen. There's a lot that we can do, of course. If we're locked into 24 frames per second, there's a lot of ways to make it look slower or faster without changing the frame rate, uh, which, of course, we'll learn in a moment. But at this point here, I'm going to... Um, uh, I'm going to show you right now the character is moving across the screen because my tracing image is on several parts of the drawing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to combine all of these into one spot, all of them kind of in the same place so that they all animate in one place. Now, the, the point of that is then I can further, by the help of the software, make it walk like I'm going to animate the movement of the walking, but then I'm going to tell animate, move it from here to here to here to here. And so it will walk across the screen wherever I want, and it'll be moving the whole time. And then the whole animation, the illusion of animation will be more complete. Right now, it's kind of moving across the screen very fast, but we're going to consolidate all of those movements into one object, and then we can have it animate where we want. So I want to duplicate this layer. I want this copy here as this original that I'm not going to edit and then work on my copy. So lock this, walk one layer. And um, you can uh, click if you click the, um, either to the left of the, I don't know if that's visible down there, but if you click to the left of the name of the layer, you see how it selects the layer at all frames. I select all those frames. We can do copy a layer. I guess we also have even easier duplicate layer. Let's do it that way. So make sure you click to the left of your walk one layer to select everything. Then right click duplicate layer. I have walk one, walk one copy. Fine, that's a, that's a fine name for it. I've got an exact perfect copy of both layers. Every drawing, every animation, every color, everything. So that's very useful. Right click duplicate a layer. And that walk one, I, I don't want to see it or work with it. So I, I want to turn it into a guide, just like my tracing layer. So this is a sort of a way to, to deactivate it. Because even if I just hide it, that's not really deactivating it. I need to deactivate the layer so that when I actually test the movie, it doesn't actually show up. So on the walk one, double click that, change that to guide, lock invisible. Copy. A copy of it. Now, to make it easy, right now, this first pose is at, let's say, coordinates x, y of, uh, you know, 25. And then this one's at 50. And this one's at 75. You know, it's a different, literally different points on the screen. I want them all to be on the same place. So one way to do this is, if you click on the frame, which then selects what you've gone, what you've drawn there, it's the same as a as a select like this. But by clicking on the frame itself, it guarantees that it selects everything that's on the screen. You can also click and then right click, select all somewhere, Control A. But I want to select that and then do Edit Cut, not copy, but cut, and then Edit paste in center, a way to do it with other options and so forth. But here's just a quick way. Whatever I have 
put it exactly in the center of my document. And then on frame three, same thing, go to frame three, click that frame three, edit, cut, edit, paste in center, five, click on frame five, keyframe five, edit, cut, shortcuts there. So all of these I am, wherever they were, I'm cutting them and pasting them into center. See why in a moment. It was useful to draw each of these. It was useful to draw each of these based on the tracing image, yes. But for really animating it, as we will see in a moment, we want them all in the same place so that when we do this movement over here, then the loop looping will be something like that. It doesn't let you do something in the layer by the left. Now, notice what's happening here. I cut it and I pasted each one of them in the center. I let it do the calculation for me. Where's the center of my screen? I don't know. Cut and paste on center, it'll do it. There's other ways to do it. Now here, the little character's walking in place and I've got to maybe smooth out the animation here and there. But the point of this is I'm putting it together in a certain place so that the um, illusion of movement can be done a lot better in a moment where I've got a world, I've got a street, and it's and the character's walking to this street corner and then walking to the mailbox over here and this and that. We'll do all of that, of course. But here now, it's all in one place to, um, to work with. And I noticed I, I put eyes on the first couple of frames, but then I forgot on the rest. So he's walking with his eyes closed. So let me pause there. That was slightly complex, but any anyone need any help at the moment? We cut the drawing from where it was and put it right in the same place on top of itself, right in the center of the document. To see the loop, I can do test movie, or if I don't want to click that, remember we also have here a bunch of play buttons. There's a regular play that'll play one time, keyboard shortcut pressing end, sure. But then we've also got here, loop it. It's interesting because you can have it loop, press play, it'll loop within the boundaries that you set up here. You have to turn that on and then set the boundaries of where to loop. So when we do the when we do the test movie this way, it's going to play everything, which I might not want. I've already got you know two minutes of animation. I don't want to play everything from the beginning. I might turn on the loop at one point in my animation. Later, of course, we'll talk about things like scenes and the like to break up the animation into chunks. And at the moment, the drawing that I made here on my whole document is kind of small. Maybe I want it larger. So if I were to select the drawing and resize it, okay, cool, it's gonna be bigger. But that's only happening on one frame. And I've got all these other frames. Well, the cool thing is that we have the ability to make edits across multiple frames. Because I want all of these to be resized the same amount. And I don't want to do it by going to this frame and resize, then this frame and resize, and this frame and do it wrong. We have a way to do multiple edits at once. 
is the icon of, where did they put it? The multi-edit icon, edit multiple frames, here it is. So I'm on frame one, there's this icon here, edit multiple frames. It gives you a boundary, a, a, a boundary right here, beginning to end. Obviously, all of these things at once. Turn on that edit multiple. You put your range to everything. I want to edit. I want to select all of these frames at once to reach, resize them all at once. I showed you that if you click to the left side of a layer that selects all your frames. So make sure you've got this edit multiple frame active, then you can click on the left of the layer to select all frames. And then notice how it kind of looks like that. You've selected it all. It's moving really, really fast like the flash. And then after that, you can get the free transform, resize all your frames at once, maybe hold down shift so that it doesn't deform your drawing, make it as large as you want. Edit multiple frames. Can be very useful that if you've drawn something and then you later need to change it in multiple frames, you have that ability. Now, as you get better at using the software and making all of this stuff, you can kind of think a little bit more ahead of what you need to do and do it right the first time compared to having to redo it later or fix it later. Uh, most things you can fix later, but we'll run into a few times when you should have done it right the first time, but you didn't know that you were doing it wrong the first time. And that comes with practice. So that's the good and the bad of the software. So we have more to talk about. We're going to upgrade it from a stick figure to an actual shape and character and such for more practice in a moment. We're getting to the point of our break. Um, it's about one o'clock. So um, we should take a break. Um, take a break until 1.10 or so. You can do more practice if you want. Step outside. Um, just take a little break, bathroom break and the like. We'll be back at 1.10. And if you need any help so far, call us over. But next up, more practice with the drawings.
right, let's get going. And um, we have, thanks to the assistance we have in the, um, we've got a few more examples if you further want to practice on your own in the um, data files, the web design folder. We have a folder, we have a, a file, uh, walk cycle animation references. There's a folder there if you want a copy of it with various um, files themselves, and then also links so that P, it, it does animate open web P files easily? Did you check if they are openable there? So running man animation sprite 600 web P, it'll probably open it, but if you check for me, please. And then there's also a walk cycle animation links. So there's just a bunch of links, even more to, um, to look at, to practice with all of this. So as usual, practice makes perfect. So we're gonna practice with this one more time in a slightly different way. And in this case, we're gonna set ourselves up kind of knowing that eventually I want all of my frames in the same place so that when it animates, it's animating in, this, in place rather than across the screen. So to set up this one, I'm going to my walk one copy. I'm gonna lock it, I'm gonna hide it. I'm gonna double click it to turn it into a guide. A layer called walk two. Under walk two, where I'm gonna draw my, draw my uh, character again, this time in a couple of different ways. I know that all of the movement has to happen in one place. So I'm gonna set up guides. I'm gonna set up a, you know, sort of coordinates where I know I want it to happen at. And I'm gonna fill it in as a little bit more of a filled in character instead of a stick figure so that I have a little bit more of a filled in character. So zooming in, I'm gonna use my very first uh, frame right here as a reference. So on this brand new layer, so all I did here was create a new layer. And on this new layer, going to start with this first drawing. But before I draw, I want these guides. I want these lines that will help guide me where I'm gonna draw. So go up to the view menu and we've got rulers, view rulers, handy shortcut, control, alt, shift, r. It's all the fingers for that one. View rulers, now you have these rulers. So this is the same as any other software if you're used to Photoshop or Illustrator and the like. But what these rulers do is I can click on the vertical ruler, for example, I can click and drag and pull out a guide that won't appear, that won't be um, when I, if I import it as, as a, if I export it as a, a ping or any other file, it's not going to be there. It's kind of hard to see on the projector, but I have this vertical line. I can put out as many as I want when I'm designing my project. If I don't want a particular line. I can just grab it and move it back out, back to the ruler. That's happening with the selection tool. So I can do horizontal ones, vertical ones. You can change the color of these if I don't like that color. Um, the color of rulers. Now, is that based on the color of the layer or is that its own color? Just a moment here. It's its own color. Okay, so if you want to change the color of these rulers so that they're more visible, it's, I believe up on the edit, preferences, regular preferences. Somewhere here. Like the color, the assistants will, will help find this in a moment. How do you change the color of your um, rule of your guides if you want them another color? So if you can look that up. But anyway, whatever color these are, I wanna use these as a guide because I wanna put a vertical ruler on the back of the foot here and then a horizontal ruler on the bottom of the foot. So I want that as a sort of point zero, the zero marker 
that you know draw this character more full figured. Go to the next frame, F7, and draw it more full figured. And then when I finish drawing it, there. So I'm going to kind of already know what I'm about to do. They're all going to be, have to be lined up. So there's a little guide there. Might be helpful for you. You can make the guides wrap around the whole character because at this point here, this is sort of like the most extended version of the character. Box all around it. But if I keep within those boundaries, that might help. Although, again, if it's a cartoony type of a character, there's going to be some squash and stretch where it does go outside of the boundaries, which is normal. But I'm just showing you that this might be useful as a, um, a way that you draw. So I want to draw this um, character. Let me use the actual pen on this. Yes. Alt Shift G. Okay, but it'd be uh, over here somewhere also on a menu item. We'll find it in a moment, but this might be useful for everyone. So apparently, Control Shift Alt and then G brings up the guides uh, panel here. Where I, if I don't like the color of guides, that might be too hard to see. I can change them to other colors. Show them, snap them. Yeah, uh, it is really only one set of guides. And then you might lock them if you want so that you don't accidentally move them around. I think you can get to it maybe under window or view or somewhere. But anyway, control, alt, shift, G. Right click. There we go. All right. We've also got clear guides, show guides, etc. So that's useful. Thank you. If you want to right click, we have a whole section on guides. Edit them for your colors and such. So let me guide you here. I'm going to try to a little bit more um, with my um, N. Now, if you do watch one of the videos on the uh, that BAM animation, they do mention that when you're doing animation and such in the real world, they highly recommend for you to not do the classic technique that is this technique where we go over and over and over on our lines to get the perfect lines like that. Everyone does that starting off and, and that's a way to go. But for animation, that's gonna be a big problem because you have so many of these lines that when you do the animation, it's just gonna be a very kind of like wiggly style, which you might want, but the smoother styles do work better when you have smoother lines. Now, if you watch those videos, they do talk about there, there's some exercises to get used to drawing digitally, uh, like the zebra technique, which check the video to see what I'm talking about, but you ideally do want one curve. And yeah, the head bulged out over there, that's wrong. Okay, I'm, uh, control Z, do it again, sure. It's however, the technique of you doing it as smooth as possible for animation that will save you in the future. Now, what might be useful, because I know that when I draw with real paper and pencil in the real world myself, I often move around my sheet of paper to accompany the natural movement of my hand. I know that I can make a very nice curve this way. Well, if I move my paper to take advantage of that curve that I can do naturally, great, in the real world. You can do that in Animate as well. There's an icon right on top over here, rotation tool. Selecting that, clicking and dragging up and down, will then rotate sort of the sheet of paper that you're drawing on, and maybe the natural curve of where your hand is gonna, is gonna go will work better. Now you do have to then memorize, okay, switch over on the keyboard B, to turn on my brush, if you hold, it's the shortcut, oh, if you hold, Shift space bar, you get the movement. If you let that go, then you can draw. So yeah, it's a lot to memorize, but 
You see here, B for brush so that I can draw. Space bar to drag around. Hold shift, space bar to rotate. If you want to jump back to perfectly straight again, you can double click the rotation tool. But I recommend to start to get used to that. Shortcuts. Need to rotate it a little, shift space bar, rotate it a little bit, draw my line. Brush tool, shift space bar, rotate my canvas, draw, rotate, draw, and such. Part of this is not just let's draw stick figures. Part of this is let's get used to this digital thing. Let's practice with a, an unnatural thing. Whereas paper and pencil is so natural, we've done that for years. Now we have to, I'm looking at a screen, but my hand is down here. And all my life, I've looked at the thing that I'm drawing. And I got to look here, but here as well. Unless you're fancy and you have a cool tablet where you can actually see what's on it. But it just takes practice. That's why we are going to have lots of time for the actual animation looking at the syllabus, right? So try that for a bit. Draw that first. Um, Draw that first character. Don't worry about getting it exactly as the original drawing is, but maybe filling it in a bit more. If you want the uh, pressure sensitivity or not, maybe try that without the pressure sensitivity so that the lines are uniform. Maybe you want it that way, whatever you want to do. In this case, I think I'll try it without pressure sensitivity. Resizing your lines if you want. So if you're able to create lines in one fell swoop when necessary, you can do so. Or of a, what was the term? That'll be more of a um, self-assured line. You can still infinitely edit it. But I've got my first drawing there. Pretty close. Practice, rotate, etc. Going to create a new blank keyframe, same as before. Paying attention, I can do it on frame two instead of frame one before we do the right. Right click, remove that frame, and that frame will drop back to one. So we move it to frame three at seven, and then draw it again. Then I'm going to use the move select tool. To move that drawing that I make on frame three, and move it to so the thing. Helpful also to show you there's a new drawing which needs to match up with the old drawing. The next student will let you see before and after on a frame. Line is up. So in my case, I need to remove that mistake frame. Then I go to frame three, right click. Blank keyframe, again, shortcuts here, very, very, very useful. F5, F6, F7. F5, give more time to a keyframe. Show a keyframe longer. Pause longer. F5, give more time. F6, copy the previous drawing to make a new change onto it. F7, give me a brand new sheet of paper, a brand, brand new frame. So all of these have a purpose. F7. That one.
watch the BAM video, they talk in there about how professional animators memorize control Z, their hand is there. They draw one line, terrible, control Z, draw it again, terrible, control Z, draw it again, terrible. Fifth time, perfect, move on. It's perfectly fine to do it one, two, three, ten times to have one line perfect in the professional realm. So here I've drawn frame two. I'm going to turn on onion skinning. It shows me my previous drawing. I'm currently on frame three, which I will select. The character over. I can move it over by hand with the mouse. I can use the arrow keys on my keyboard once I've selected the drawing of my second keyframe. Some of this terminology again, I've got in my animation at the moment, it's well 16 frames. I would just say, on my second keyframe, second keyframe is very important. My second keyframe is on frame three in my timeline. You can see first keyframe, second keyframe, third position. So that sort of terminology to be aware of. I'm going to edit my third keyframe, which happens to be on frame six or whatever. I just have to think of in two different things at the same time. So this third frame, which has my second keyframe, I need to move it over. I'm just going to do it with my arrow keys after I select the drawing with the arrow keys on the keyboard. Hold down shift and then left. I can move it over precisely from the keyboard. And I'm not trying to line it up exactly so that this back leg is lining up with the back leg. Not exactly. This is, this is a guide. The box in here is a guide where it should be in general. Because if you make it that each leg, if you make it that that back leg is always touching this corner right here, it's going to look slightly weird. It's going to look like the foot is stuck with the gum or something. It does have to be movement that happens. But the guides are there for a guide to kind of put it in the right spot. You're the right spot. And that is happening there very easily with the onion skin mode. So then now I've got to go to my third keyframe. So jump two frames, frame five, F7. Today we're doing this the hard way. We're doing this the complicated way. We'll of course show the easier ways. Aren't computers supposed to make our life easier? Well, yes, animate is going to help us with that. But first, we're going to go the long way. We're going to do the difficult way, the handcrafted frame by frame way. And then, of course, I'll show. Well, why don't I, why don't I just put bones inside this character and tell it to animate? Yeah, it can do that. But before that, we're going to go the, the long way. Then we'll take shortcuts. And cons to doing it in every type of way. For example, this frame-by-frame, hand-drawn way, you have the most control. Frame-by-frame, hand-drawn way, you have the most control. What's a negative? It takes forever. You got to draw the line again and again and again. There is the automated ways that we will see. The positive of that, it'll be a lot faster, but the negative is you'll have less control. It might look more mechanical. Maybe not as smooth, depending how you use the automation. So there's my third keyframe. Turn on onion skinning, maybe.
that frame move it over. So that snap could be helpful. At the very least, I do want that foot touching that bottom keyframe. So if it snaps in place, great. And again, I'm not trying to put it back leg touching the back. Um, it'll be a kind of a weird lateral or horizontal wobble that will happen, which you might want actually. And you can play with what that looks like a little later. But within the Boundaries overall of the character. I have my third keyframe. So you get the idea. You try that for a moment. Check in with you in a moment. I go to my fourth keyframe, F7, draw that, move it on top of my guide area. Next one, next one, next one. We'll go on with that in a moment. So get more practice with the drawing tool. Intro. Et cetera. This is all practice. Little by little steps that have to do Sometimes there is just two weeks.
All right, so we'll move on in just a moment, but hopefully you've gotten to the point where you have another version of the little walker. So try to get that finished up in a couple more minutes. I have more to show you here, but uh, this animation happening here, uh, want to get to something similar to that, that you've got those eight keyframes, and then I'll show you what more to do with it. So maybe just three minutes at the most. If you're not quite done, that's okay. So 145, and then I'll go on with that. Help, everyone doing okay? Right, so let's move on here. Let's say that this 
animation is happening. Okay, very nice. And it is separate frames on one layer. What we can do is further combine all of these different frames into one object. Right now, they're not really one object. They're one bunch of lines on different frames. But we can combine all of those frames, as many layers as we want, into one object, something known as a movie clip. So different ways to kind of consider it in different apps. But in Animate, we call these things an object. Now, the way I'll show you the basic concept first, and then how we can apply it here. Um, go ahead for a moment and lock this layer, hide this layer, turn it into a guide, just to deactivate it for the moment. So we have one thing to focus on. A new layer. And then this new layer, draw whatever, just a face, let's say. So brand new layer, brand new frame. And how this is gonna diverge from everything else, I'm going to convert this into a movie clip so that any further things I do to it are kind of all grouped together in one object, one movie clip. Here, the difference is that every frame is its own separate thing, and I might have seven layers, and they're all on their own separate thing. If I work with things inside of movie clips, that whole comet flying animation is one object, the trees rustling are their own object, the character walking is its own object, so everything's kind of grouped together into its own collection of frames and drawings and so forth. So. I'm going to select everything. Just click on the frame to select everything. And then we have up on top, modify, convert to symbol, F8. That's another one we'll use over and over. F5, add more time to the animation. F6, duplicate the previous drawing. F7, new drawing. F8, whatever you're currently selected, convert it to a symbol. Selecting that gives you the pop-up to give it a name plus other options. We'll just call this face or character or name of the character or whatever. Here, what type? Movie clip, button, graphic, registration. If we wanted to rotate the thing, let's say this is rotating as it's coming at us, it's rotating. Well, on what point will it rotate? If it rotates from the center, it's going to be perfectly aligned rotating from the center. If we have this on the bottom left corner, when it rotates, it'll rotate like from the bottom, like let's say it's planted on the ground and rotating this way. We have these registration points. So for the moment, some name, make sure the type is movie clip. Registration, you often want it in the center when some sprite or character or whatever rotates and moves around, probably from the center. Click OK. So now there's this little box around the drawing. My properties tell me you've got an object, which is a movie clip, different from a moment ago when it was a shape. If I, with the Select tool, try to go to the edge and push it and pull it like I've been doing other times, it doesn't do it. The whole thing is selected. The whole thing is one object. This is a movie clip. Everything that was that drawing has then its X and Y coordinates. And I've got now these new things here, blending modes. Maybe I want to change colors of, of this um, drawing in a way under these color effects. I have over here, blend it. These might be familiar if you're used to Photoshop or other software, Lighten, Multiply, et cetera. We have filters we can add to it. There's a lot of fun stuff. We won't get too far into it. Here's the part where the 3D of it all can be set up, but there's a lot that we'll look at here. The point is that this was originally just a basic drawing and now it's a movie clip. And a movie clip is sort of its own pocket universe. It exists, it has its own layers, its own frames, its own drawings, its own everything, independent from everything else. 
to access that, we can do it in a couple of ways. Now we have over here properties library, assets, properties library is one way. And in the library I have, in my case, oh, when I put that graphic in a while ago, it kept track of it in this library. And now when I created this, when I converted this to a movie clip, it says you've got this object, this movie clip right here. And if you double click it from the library, this opens up, it's kind of subtle and you'll get used to it. But now at the top left over here, this is showing you're inside of that movie clip. You're in the world of this object. You can press back and that takes you back to scene one. It takes you back to everything else you were doing. But when you double click it from your library, notice it says, here's the timeline of this one object. Here's all of these layers and drawings and everything of this one object. Now, this is going to give us very powerful things as we go on. But again, I'm saying, what if I put all of these trees together as a, as a movie clip? The trees themselves, I then do a million frames of animation of them waving around and such. I make another movie clip object of waves at the beach. And those are animating and doing their own way as their own object. And then I have my main character as its own object, as its own movie clip. So each thing that is going to be a little animation is its own mini animation. And then I can just copy and paste them in. I make one tree waving around. And I'll show you in a moment. Then we put 10 copies of those tree and all the trees move around and shake around and animate. This is a very powerful concept. In a sense, these are kind of like sprites. We're kind of designing sprites here. In a game, a sprite is one object of the game, usually a character. So editing the, um, from the library, editing the object there, I'm just going to make like three frames of animation here. I'm going to uh, go to frame three, F6, and then maybe just kind of change the face a little bit somehow. Okay, it's growing, it's growing fangs, sure. And then the uh, eyes are getting angry, I guess. Something like that. And then another one, F6. So again, I'm doing F6 so that I can make changes to what I've previously drawn instead of a brand new F7. I'm just trying to make some changes, animation. I've got three frames. Three keyframes. Frames, this animation is happening in the parallel universe, in the pocket universe of this object, independent of the main timeline. All my layers that I had a moment ago. This pocket universe of this object, I can do whatever I want here. There's some basic animation here. And then going back to my main timeline, even though this is one frame, on the main timeline of one, it's brand new layer two, one frame. When I test my movie, play my movie, it's doing its three frames of animation that existed in the object. This one object has its own animation. And if it's an object in my library, if it's, if it's a movie clip, what if I drag a copy here, drag a copy here? What about if I make this one rotated, this one big? This one's small. Each one is its own independent timeline and drawings and little world. And then I'm just copying them out of the library onto the screen and I've got copies. Yes, I can of course make each one slightly different in different ways. They're all playing exactly at the same time, same frame rate, all of that stuff. All of that can be edited, of course. Consider what about if I'm making a star field? What if I design like three different stars? This one blinks a certain way. This one blinks another way. This one blinks another way. I've got three stars that I've designed and animated in my um, library here. And I just drop copies onto them and make a whole star field. 
replicating these objects is a very powerful thing. That we will have a lot of practice with. But at this point, it's just sort of a starting point of things to uh, more powerful things that we're going to look at. Like, for example, the, uh, the walk cycle that we did here. For example, the little walking character, I could put this into its own uh, movie clip as well. Let's do this, where I had started to draw something and then converted to a movie clip. I instead will maybe create a brand new movie clip automatically, a brand new symbol, a brand new object. Let's do it this way instead. Under the library panel, we have an icon at the bottom there, new symbol. Let's call this Walker. Creating a new symbol, it's a movie clip, it's got some name, I click OK. This one automatically put me inside of the timeline of that object. See, empty timeline. Pressing that back button takes me to my main timeline. This symbol is empty. I just spent a moment trying to make a, an animation of a character walk over here. Well, copy and paste. I want to copy all of these frames of this layer, paste them into this waiting movie clips timeline to accomplish what I showed here very crudely about the faces. So I'm going to lock my face layer, unlock my lock two layer. Clicking on the left of the layer, right click, copy that layer. If those symbols don't show up on, the, on this initial universe of layers, right? Can you say that again? So, like right now, like, is there a layer for those symbols where you're clicking on? Or there is the, there is like, there's the scene one. But that's a whole separate, it's somewhere else, right? That's the main timeline that exists when you create a brand new file. There's always one scene. There's always one like main timeline. It's not in anything. It's one main timeline scene one. Yes, that's what I'm looking at right now. So this is going to be important to pay attention to what, what am I doing? Where am I? What am I working with at the moment? I'm on the main scene one. And then when I open up this face symbol, it says, okay, now you're in the, you're in this face timeline. You're in this face symbol. So I just have to get used to Looking at that top left corner now, now I'm in the walker symbol. Pressing back takes me to the main scene one, where all of the work I've done so far today exists. What I'm trying to do here is, well, this that I drew previously, right click that layer, copy. Double click the walker that I made a moment ago. Right click, paste, layers. So that animation that I made on the main timeline, the basic timeline, I copied that layer into a branded new symbol that I made here. Back to my main timeline. I copy over a drag over a copy. from the library there. Starting to put together a little army. Large because it's closer, small because it's further, faded out color, et cetera. All that stuff we can do, we'll learn, of course. But this is the tip of the iceberg of things that we will learn as we go on about um, Working with sprites.
working with one object as it's a, as a movie clip symbol, duplicating it, editing it, rotating it, making it move across the screen mechanically and so forth. It's a very powerful concept. idea let's say you need to do you need to do some kind of animation over and over instead of manually uh, making a bunch of layers and copies of the thing you can have a like a like a main parent object that then you make duplicates of clones of like I'm showing here and each one will be doing its own animation each one can be edited so that it starts on a different foot let's say so instead of drawing 10 swaying palm trees, I draw three of them, swaying in different ways, and then build up a little forest with all three of those different animations. The great thing about Adobe Animate is that it's this vector-based drawing program where whatever I draw, and it's a small size, looks nice and sharp and so forth. People love to work with Animate for various projects, film and animation and anime and so forth, because it'll look great um, on your mobile device, you know, this size here, or looking at it on your big screen or in the movie theater and the like. This is a mathematically calculated animation behind the scenes. I don't know how it works, but what I see the result is smooth. All these drawings, all these lines are still very, very smooth. Zooming in even more, that big. It's tiny. Tiny guy all the way in the back, smooth. Right, so, um, Oh, I have, so my, you might've noticed my alarm was going off here. I have a, uh, I'm, I'm going to get a phone call any minute now, unfortunately, and I couldn't reschedule it. So I'm going to end the recorder at this point. And um, there's the number right there, actually. So hopefully they call back one moment so as I finish my thought. So I'm going to end the recorder at this point, And then um, you can have time to work and so forth or practice or not. And there's the two assignments that are due this week. None of this animation stuff is due at the moment, but again, practice makes perfect. So uh, I would practice if I were you, but uh, we've got more to learn, of course. This is our first look at our animation stuff and it's, uh, it's uh, plenty more to learn.